All right, hello and welcome to another uh, league here on TCGDplayer.com. My name is Steve Rubin. Today I'm going to be playing the uh, kind of uh, thrown by the wayside uh, Abzan Archangel deck. Now, a little a little brief musings about this deck itself. This deck is based off of a deck that uh, Jeff Hoogland had played at the Star City Invitational. Um, I'm a little late to upload my video this week, but I, I got a lot of information from, from watching those guys play. I'm assuming that he tested this deck a lot, so I thought that, hey, maybe I should take it for a spin. Uh, I think it, it's a pretty solid deck. Like, I always loved the, the core archetype because just playing against it sometimes seems so helpless when they just start, uh, you know, courting for whatever and getting eternal witnesses and there's just nothing you can really do. Um, I remember at the last Modern Pro Tour, there was a guy who went like 8-2 or 9-1 with a Spike Feeder combo deck that was much different than the typical Abzan Coco deck, where he played like a bunch of Spike Feeders on a bunch of Archangels. This is like on the polar opposite end of those decks, where we're playing, this is like a fair deck. You don't really Spike Feeder Archangel people very often, um... And it's about having a good amount of interaction, and then also just being able to grind out games. So it's more of like a, more of like an Abzan mid-range deck that has the Archangel Spike Feeder, and obviously has Court of Calling in it. Um, but notably, not Abzan Coco. You don't have the fast combo kills. You don't have the Cuglet companies. Um, notably, you're a little bit better against Cage, and there's a lot of Cage right now. Uh, just based on the fact that Dredge is a thing, and I learned after playing this deck. In a few, you know, a few uh, league events that people will overboard because when people see your, this deck, they actually all they almost always assume it's a collected company deck. I've seen almost everybody board in. It's not wrong, but they board in like Cage. They board in Nihil Spellbomb. A lot of the times you just win anyway. It reminds me of the old Pod stuff where they can board in their hate cards and you just win anyway because your deck's full of good stuff. Um, and that's pretty much what this deck's trying to do. Um, so let's go ahead and get into the deck tech for Noble Hierarchs. Uh, previously, people played birds, and it's possible you want some birds, but this deck is like kind of a fair deck. The, having Exalted is really nice. The blue does give you the, the little spell skin activation, but notably that I uh, decided to play with some Fulminator Mages, which we'll talk about later, which makes the mana a bit bad with the Nobles, plus Fulminator Mages doesn't really synergize, but the Nobles are solid, one of the best cards in Modern. You see it in a lot of different decks. Um, just gives you that early game boost, let, lets you play smoothly, lets, is almost never a bad draw in the first few turns of the game, just to develop your mana. So Noble Hierarch, solid card. Uh, Path to Exile, a bit different. Normally these decks play like a split or a bunch of Abrupt Decays. <coughs> Excuse me, because of the, just the, you know, huge prevalence of Dredge, uh, Poison, and Death Shadow Zoo, it's just important to have the paths. Like actually be able to exile. It's not you know it's not that great against pathing dredge is usually pretty futile because they'll start casting uh, grave trolls against you. But it is you know more effective than abrupt decay is for the most part. And obviously against death shadow in game one they don't have any basics. Uh, just much cheaper you know. And against poison obviously it kills uh, inkwap nexus in addition to everything else. So even though it gives them a land is generally going to be better than abrupt decay. Pretty solid. Um, not sure if you should have a split of Paths and Abrupt Decays, but the Paths did perform pretty well for me. Two Scavenging Us, solid card, good card target. Um, extra one is nice with a lot of dredge decks. It's really good in the late game. You know, it's 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 solid randomly against Snapcaster Mages, but just a lot of times they trade off. You play it, it's huge. Or if you play against a Graveyard deck like Dredge or Gordo's Vengeance, it's obviously great. Wall of Roots, a card that... Um, you know, see some play in these kind of decks. Some people don't play it. Some people play one or two. Playing the full three in this deck. This deck is like a witness core of calling deck. Um, not that all these decks aren't, but I find that wall is pretty reasonable. You know, it, it plays okay against some of the aggressive decks of the format and also gives you mana. Really good with quarter calling because it gives you two mana. And then just really good in general because it can give you mana on your turn and your opponent's turn, which can be nice. One because probably Pride Mage. A pretty solid, good body on its own. You know, important so that you can kill Ensnaring Bridge, or you can kill uh, Cranial Plating, or stuff like that. Uh, Blood Moon, plenty of plenty of things. Pretty much always play one in your 60-card deck. Three Voice Resurgence, solid card. Honestly, I felt that it's, Modern is going really unfair right now, and I feel like that Three Voice might, which it's ridiculous to say because it's just so good in the matchup it's good. 
I think that three voice might just be a little bit too many. Um, anyway, Spellskite. Spellskite's really, really good right now. Like the the ability to core for Spellskite wins you so many games with this deck. Like if you saw Banto draws, you would play like one or two Spellskites just just to like ancient stars for this deck could be cored for. It. And there, are, you know, several decks that just kind of fold to it. Like if you get it against uh, Death Shadow Zoo, and a lot of times against Infect, it can be just super, super powerful. Excuse me. And they're just a good card overall. Um, you know, it does protect your combo a little bit. It doesn't really... In this deck, like... In Banzal Drowsy, you know, you're protecting like your Displacers and you're protecting your Thought Knots. This deck doesn't really have that. So it's not like a proactive card. It's more of a reactive card in this deck. Uh, three Collective Brutality. This is like the Jeff Hoogland tech. I believe that he... Excuse me, Hoogland. I know that he likes his name being pronounced correctly. Um... He played Country Brutality. He won a classic with a Kiki deck that splashed this. And then I guess he realized that if he wants to play this, it just seems absurd to play Kiki and not Abzan. <laughs> because the mana in Kiki is already bad. So adding a black card, I'm sure. Even though you usually play like one Pontiff and some Slaughter games, like it just it just is going to make the mana even worse. Um, basically, this card is just really, really good against some of the creature combo decks of the format. Um, the ability to kill your opponent's Idol on the Great Rebel. Their Step Links, their Glistener Elf, and also to rest them is great. Um, it's reasonable against decks like even like Jun, you know, you can kill Dark Confidant and stuff like that. It's kind of a weird card because it's never really a blowout. Like, yes, it's really it's good to like kill a creature and get their hand. Um, you're discarding a card. The trick is that the monitor is just so fast and the decks are so linear that this is never a blowout in terms of like card advantage. Like sometimes you miss, sometimes it doesn't. All the modes don't apply, but it's just so big to be able to play this against a linear deck. Because if you resolve this against a deck like Burn or a deck like uh, Infect, you can just win on the spot by just taking their best play in their, you know, taking their best card in play and taking their best card in their hand, and pretty much at little cost to you. Like discarding does suck. Like a lot of the times it's like, oh man, what do I discard? What do I discard? And that's kind of a telling sign of. Hey, these collective brutalities are not that insane because I need to. It is a real cost to discard cards, but mm, I should have done this when I was so sick. I'm sorry. Um, the collective brutality just allows you to just on the spot like take over a game, you know. And then it's not bad. There are very few matchups where it's bad. Like I did, you know, play against some matchups where it's bad, but I think it's a reasonable card. Um, it makes this deck a little bit less. What's the word? It makes it a little less. Uh, robust like you don't have as many creatures and you don't have you know like extra toolbox creatures or extra mana creatures like birds of paradise but you're really trying to grind out and collective brutality helps you be more of a control deck a lot of times okay moving on up let's just move over to lingering souls here lingering souls is a card that um right now is kind of in a weird spot you know we saw like when grim flare was printed and people playing regular abzan the Lingering Souls kind of became a bit popular just because it's so good with Grim Flare and it's just a good card. Like, rarely is it bad. Um, it is pretty good against some of the decks like uh, Affinity and decks like uh, Poison and Control decks. So it does a lot, but it is like an almost do nothing against some decks like Ad Nauseum or, you know, sometimes like a Death Shadow deck. So it is a weird card. Like, when you have three Souls and three Collective Brutalities, it actually changes how this deck plays out a lot because you kind of have these touchy, like, really powerful effects, and you're kind of, like, to play them, you're taking away from the overall core of the deck. This is not a Coco deck, obviously, but it's not even really an Archangel Spike through the deck. It very rarely comes together, um, which is fine. And the Lingering Souls are in there, you know. As you'll see, we have three Gabney Townships to sort of push through an, a game-ending play with the Lingering Souls. And they do supplement the collective brutalities. I the, the, I like playing them because, like the ability, like I said, the discard is a real cost. And if you actually have something that is better in the graveyard, it can be really nice. The other thing is that lingering souls actually works pretty nicely with cord. There are a lot of games where you just have cord gummed up in your hand. And like I said, this deck really is a cord deck. Once you get cord online, like if you resolve a cord for three or more, like you're probably in good shape. And lingering souls helps you get there without that much of an investment. Um, a lot of times you can play Lingering Souls or even play it, flash it back, and then still core on that same turn, assuming you have enough greens 
green sources, green creatures. Um, so yeah, Lingering Souls, solid. Uh, not so that this is like the right configuration, maybe you want them in the sideboard, but it is a powerful card and does make this deck, like give it, this deck another angle of attack. Or as a Pontiff, one of your one of your targets, you know, it is really important to have. Can be really good against like Master of Waves, obviously great against Affinity, uh, solid against Infect. Spike Feeder, part of your combo, if you don't know how it works, Spike Feeder plus Archangel makes, you know, Gains you infinite life and makes your creatures infinite. Infinite three eternal witness. This is a pretty big difference. Like we're playing a grindy version and and Hoagland, I think kind of popularized. Like usually in his Kiki Core decks, he plays three witness, which is higher. And more, normally people play one or two, and I think that it's mostly just because we're playing a lot of cheap, extra cheap spells, and we're also playing extra walls. So we like have like more mana and just more cheap things to do. So I think the witnesses are good, and I could even see even I guess people board in a lot of graveyard hate, but I could see playing four witness. I could see a version of playing four witness. It's, it, it is that good. Um, obviously, it's a weird card because like a two one by itself isn't that great, but in this deck, like having the extra body around is pretty solid for quarter calling and for like gravity township and stuff. A uh, restoration angel, you know, just go to four. This deck is really streamlined. Like some people put like sun titans and thrag tusks and stuff. I just have more early game interaction. We're kind of foregoing like anything too flashy, like no Rebel Arc, you know, is a, is a big notable card that's not in here. And we're just playing a Resto Angel, a Linvala, and a Sea Drowner. I actually, Linvala is a solid creature, just as a 3 4 flyer. There are very few decks it's good against right now. Like, it's great against Affinity, so it's important to have, and it's great against, uh, it can be okay against Infect, but it's great against like Elves. Um, it's possible you should move it to the sideboard, it should be somewhere in the 75. But uh, Linvala is solid. Hard to cast, but solid. Archangel, part of your combo. Good card on its own in conjunction with like Ooze and uh, Collective Brutality gives you another way of triggering it, which is nice. Uh, four core, just pretty much how the deck works. Uh, core calling, you know, a lot of the times uh, you get Eternal Witness and then the next turn you can cord for more. Um, pretty self explanatory there. You have the toolbox cards, you have the combo, you have like your value cards like Ooze or Voice. Um, and then let's go ahead and get into the mana base. I'm, I'm t this, this deck takes taking a little bit longer than I expected, and my voice is really uh, deteriorating. Sorry, this isn't greatly sorted. Um, but we have five bases. Let me see if we can sort. <laughs> sort by rarity? I guess we're just sorting by color. All right, we have uh, three forests, a plains, and a swamp. A one of each basic, and then we're running nine fetch lands. Uh, Windswept Heath, Catacombs, and then one Flats. Uh, then we have two Temple Gardens, an Overgrown Tomb, and a Goblet Shrine. So that's, that's the Fetch fetch Shock mana base. Um, the reason that we have... This deck's a little different in that we have, like, the Paths, which normally these are, like, Abrupt Decays. So we have a little bit extra emphasis on the White. Um, toolbox, we're playing three Gavity Townships. I think that Gabney Township is is really good, and just always having one is nice. But there is a cost. Like the man in the deck isn't perfect, even though you're you're pretty. If you look at the main deck, you're pretty much a green white deck. The only black cards in your deck are three collective brutalities and then two like toolbox type creatures. Um, but drawing the Gabneys and drawing the basic forests means like you're gonna have awkward mana sometimes, which 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 is something that I addressed during the games, and it's possibly should be changed. One Razor Verge Thicket. A uh, weird, usually they play like thickets or horizon canopies. I don't love canopy. Like, I find that it's just such a big cost and then such small reward that I'd rather just have a little bit uh, safer mana. But I say that and I have Slesnia Sanctuary. Okay, let me explain that for a second. So, the Sanctuary is a card that back when Modern first came out, Andrew Cunio kind of like pioneered, you know, it was like the Wild West. Because like, at the Pro Tour, Pro Tour Philadelphia, they banned a bunch of stuff. But before that, before that, or after that? Now I'm confused. I, 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 I used to know. Anyway, at, at the first Worlds where there was Modern, there were six rounds of World, six rounds of Modern, and, and Andrew Cunha had like a Malira, a Malira pod deck. And he played, he always played one Golgari Rod Farm. And it's kind of like obviously super greedy, but in the context of this specific deck, it makes sense because, like, think about it. We have, like, drawing the extra card and getting the extra land drops is pretty big. Because we have, first off, we have three Gavity Townships. 
So the ability to make that, pretty much how Bounce Land works is it's like a free land drop. If you play it, it comes to play tapped, but it gives you an extra land because it taps for two. Um, so it lets us get to our Gavity Townships. It also lets us get cards back for Collective Brutality. Like part of the problem, you know, Collective Brutality, the cost is... <coughs> is discarding a card, and just having that extra card in hand means we can discard, or we could even just use like three modes and go for the full, the full like drain you as well, stuff like that. And the Celestial Sanctuary helps us get to Lingering Souls, like it helps us get to five mana to keep playing Flash It Back, helps us get the big cords off. It's weird in a deck where we're not playing like the Revel Arc or the Sun Titan or anything, but I think it actually works pretty well. And the other thing is we have these two Gideons, so I do have a pretty mana intensive deck. I find that, uh, I find that it's pretty important to be able to uh, cast your spells uh, on turn four. Like, and on this deck, you don't want to ever miss land drops. And a lot of times, you know, they bolt your birds, they bolt your wall. It's pretty important to go up the ladder. Um, anyway, that's the reason for the Sanctuary, so we'll try that out. Cyborg, two Gideons. Uh, I was going to say it's pretty self-explanatory, but it's really not. Um, like, we're in this Lingering Souls grindy deck, you know. We have this mana ramp, but, like, kind of we kind of have a vacancy here like we can't you don't really ramp out cord um and i find that gideon is really important just because this deck can be really attacked post board by control decks like jund and decks like abzan decks like blue white red uh, even and grixis control grixis control is getting really popular right now and i've noticed that they don't really play mana leak anymore they have counter squall but like two, which might may or may not even come come in against you, and to combat the uprise of Grixis control, I I poured in the Kidians. I really want the ability to have some to just I win. Like oh, I get to untap with my wall roots, or oh, I get turn three noble hierarch on the play. Like I want to just play this Gideon and win. And the other thing is, you know, with the lingering souls, it provides another anthem effect. It's just really solid. Like it is just really solid. And Grixis Control can beat it, like Snapcaster Bolt and stuff does work, like Creeping Tar Pit. It's not, like, unbelievable, or I think more people would play it. But I think it's just good enough that it makes sense. And the other thing is we have these three witnesses. So once you draw, like, having, once you draw one, you know, having access to extra Gideons the entire game is just really big. Full Mirror Mage, this is something that I threw into the sideboard because I know on Moto there's a lot of Tron. And I think they're good. Because you're playing the Surgicals, and I'll get to that when I get to that. Um, but the mana base is really bad. Uh, I ran into some huge problems. So I think if you want to play full mana mage, you have to play one less Gavany, and you probably have to not play the Celestial Sanctuary. You probably have to play a Twilight Mire. Or a Fetid Eath, which I don't really... Probably Mire because of Court of Calling. Um, so that is something you really need to keep... Like, seriously, if you watch this, and you want to play this deck, try to work with the mana, because the the... the Sideboard is very black intensive. Um, it's possible you should just not play full mana at all, but it's really, really good in those matchups. So good against blue white red, uh, fine against infect, and also very good against Tron. Uh, Reclamation Sage, sorry, this is not this is all sort of by mana cost. It's pretty tough. It gives you that extra naturalized effect. You know, if you play against Ensnaring Bridge, it's important to have as many Reclamation Sages as possible. Part of the reason Prime Mage is better is that it's a better card on its own, and then with witness it has better recursion like you can sack it return it play it again but reclamation sage good against cage um a lot of people think you're abs and coco so we're born in cage which is fine it's good against you like it stops souls and core calling um but you know other than that boggles uh tongue whatever plays it artifacts and enchantments affinity like, there are plenty of matches where it comes in loaming shaman this is just a one of for dredge Though I did actually side it in against Death Shadow Zoo just as a blocker that like nukes their graveyard to put them off the comments. Um and it, and it's solid. Like, you know, you see people playing Ravenous Trap. I think this is just for this deck is just essentially a Ravenous Trap. It's a little bit worse, obviously, than Ravenous Trap, but you have the three four quarter columns. Um <clears throat> so I think it's pretty much an auto include. Uh then we have Idol on a Rattle. This card is absolutely disgusting. I actually, when I was building this deck. After playing Kiki Cord, I had thought that maybe I want to play two. Just because if you think about the decks in this format, like not only does this help you against some of your toughest matchups, like Ad Nauseum and, and like degenerate combo decks like that, 
it is really good against just the normal creature decks. Like, it, well, I say creature decks lightly, but I'm talking about, you know, burn, poison, and I talk about them a lot, but they're just the, like, poison and death shadows are just, I think, the two staple aggro decks in the format. And Eidolon just shuts them down. Like, they can't do two things in one turn. Uh, it's really good against poison, really good against, I mean, I just said that already, but it's it's just good across the board. Ad nauseum, infect, death shadow, those are the matchups that it's mostly for. I also sometimes randomly side it against Snapcaster decks, like decks like Grixis and stuff like that, that are playing lots of like probes and, and serum visions and stuff, and they only have so many terminates. Uh, the ability to like have an unboltable card that shuts them off of Snapcaster as well is really nice. Um, Kataki, obviously good against Affinity. Um, similar to Loaming Shaman, not not everybody plays this, but I think it's just worth a one-off slot. Like I think that it's important not to get carried away with your sideboard with one ofs. Like I see so many people, I think a mistake that lots of people make when they play decks like these is they put in all these one ofs because they're like, oh, I could need this, I could need that, I could need that. But like we like we have four. We have four mana mage, but we have these four targets. And I think that like you should really make sure you have side, you know, you really shouldn't have that many. I, I'm not gonna say there's a number that's too many, because I don't really can't really say because I don't know what cards your deck needs, but just don't get carried away with one of those. If you're playing Abs and Coco and you have Collected Company and Cord, then it's a little bit more acceptable to have more cards across two or three because obviously that you know increases the chance that you see those. Um, but to finish out, we have three Thoughtseize. Uh, just don't love having Thoughtseize in my sideboard because it's a card that I usually want in the main deck. But this deck you just need has so many pieces, right? You have like the the grindy cards and you have the disruption. You just can't fit the thought season as well, but these are for combo decks um, and control decks. Pretty pretty self-explanatory, but the Surgicals, Hedge Against Dredge, but also in combination with the Full Minor Mage, gives you a chance against Tron, um, which I think is pretty nice because you can you know kill a Tron piece and Surgical it. Uh, Surgical also in a pinch can be good against some combo decks with the thought season, like against bad matchups, a deck like uh, if you play against like Living In, or if you play against... Uh, what is another good example? Like Ad Nauseum, you know, or Pyromancer Ascension deck. Like the ability to just have this free, like, get out of jail free card is really, really powerful. So Surgical, obviously, if Dredge didn't exist, you probably wouldn't be playing three Surgical Extraction. But you do have Eternal Witness. So, like, you do have the ability to Surgical, Witness Surgical, and then there are, there are matchups other than Dredge where you pour that in. Anyway, I really got to uh, finish this up. That is the deck tech for this deck, and I hope you guys enjoy the video.